בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוך השם הוא back in אבן תורה, we got uh, number 79, ברוך השם in the series, we have to start thinking about uh, doing some CDs for the series, and I was thinking about it the other day, and um, it's going to be very different because just to do what we did until now is going to require eight CDs. So... Usually we release one CD at a time. So we have to figure it out. We have to start doing the campaign. It's uh, amazing the um, the schut that Hashem gave us to, uh, to do all these shiurim is really much spreading all over the world. We have this, uh, like I told you guys, we have the uh, the Roku channel. So Baruch Hashem, the, uh, they sent me the statistics already, even though we're there for only a couple of months. Uh, and it's relatively new. Already Baruch Hashem, there's some fans from there. The app is coming out very soon, Bezod Hashem. The website is doing well. Uh, you know, so, Baruch Hashem. Torah is spreading all over the world. But the more we spread it, the more difficulties you, you encounter. You know, it's not, uh, it's not easy because you have to manage more and more people, more and more uh, different things. So, uh, Bezod Hashem, in the coming months, uh, maybe even sooner, uh, we're going to need some more volunteers. Uh, for a few different uh, jobs. Uh, so anyone that's interested, has time, has skills, uh, has knowledge, that wants to volunteer, like really volunteer, not like volunteer where you just make one phone call and then, you know, I never hear from you again. Uh, so please let me know. But uh, I think there's a, a lot of people that are looking for, uh, for the truth today. Uh, and one of the main reasons is because whether they like it or not, Everyone is finding out that the world they stood up for, the world they protected, the world they looked up to certain people, is being exposed. You know, if anyone looked up for, you know, to people in Hollywood, now they're seeing that every other day there's a new uh, report of uh, another person is a molester, another person is a rapist, another person is uh, some other form of criminal. Uh, because now that, uh, you know, the, uh, it's come out on some of the big wigs, it's now uh, uh, coming out on everyone else too. Because people are not scared anymore. People are not scared anymore because they're saying, listen, this is a, uh, look, they took out this one big guy, so maybe they'll let me, they'll hear my voice finally. Now we don't know necessarily if everything is true, if everything is false, but the reality of it is that when one person says a lie about you, it's one thing. When 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people say a lie about you, it's, a, uh, it's something else. And the Gemara actually says that even when someone lies about you, even when someone lies about you, there has to be an element of truth to it. Even if they don't know that it's true. Even they just outright created a lie about you. They created a lie about nothing. Said, oh, this guy stole. This guy stole from me. And you, you didn't steal from them. But in Shemaim, they say, yeah, you did steal. But you're from someone else. No one is blaming you for anything unless you actually did it. There's some, you have some type of negia. There's like the dust of a sin. There's a dust of a sin. And we learn in this week's parasha, uh, parashat uh, Vayetze, the Yaakov Avinu asks Hashem for some very modest requests. Unlike us, where we ask for planes, trains, and normal automobiles, everyone wants to have everything in the world, everything material, everything spiritual, no less than Moshe Rabbeinu, and Bill Gates at the same time, or maybe Korach. You want to be Moshe Rabbeinu and Korach at the same time, because Korach was richer than Bill Gates. So unlike that, you see that when uh, Yaakov Avinu leaves his parents' house, and he says that he makes a uh, neder, he makes a vow. He says, if God will be with me and will guard me on this way that I am going, will give me bread to eat and clothes to wear. That's it. He didn't say bread to eat, make sure it's the uh, special bread for $10 a bun that's helping the diet. He didn't say, uh, you know, he wants to wear uh, Versace clothes. That uh, every little t-shirt is $350. No. Shit. Bread to eat and clothes to wear. And I return in peace to my father's house. And Hashem will be a God to me. 
Then this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, shall become a house of God. So here we see that Yaakov Avinu has very, very modest request, which we understand literally. Here we say, okay, bread, he, wants, he doesn't want to starve. Fine. Clothes. Well, Hashem, it's a very, very modest request. Chazal says that Yaakov Avinu was telling Hashem, I'm willing to endure a test. I understand that this world is not a picnic. I'm willing to endure a test, but don't give me the test of poverty. But not poverty like we think poverty. Poverty like we think poverty in the Western world especially is like someone says that they're starving if they haven't eaten in two hours. They haven't eaten in two hours, they're already, oh, I'm starving, man, I haven't eaten. When? When was the last time you ate? Three, four, five days ago? Oh, no, two hours ago. You're starving? It's a different type of starving. Different type of starving. So in those days, if you're starving, it's really starving. Mamash, days. But Yaakov asked for bread. And the Gemara in Masechet Megillah says bread is actually referring to Torah. But either way, he's referring to even the basics of bread. He wants to make sure he doesn't starve to death. Said so, clothes. Just as long as I have clothes, so I don't have. I'm not embarrassing Shem Hashem. I'm not embarrassing the name of God. You know, in the Gemara, it says something horrific, horrific, very scary. That a lot of people may have missed, because I see this all the time. It's very dangerous. It says that a Talmid Chacham, Talmid Chacham, someone knows Torah, walks out of his house with a stain on his shirt, has no Olam Abba, loses Olam Abba. Talmid Chacham walks out of his house, stain on his shirt. We're not talking about he walks out with a cross on his head. I'm not talking about like this imbecile made a video of uh, telling people that uh, you shouldn't be scared of Xmas. And he, him and his uh, religious kids are shopping for Christmas trees. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, that. I'm talking about a guy, Tamit Chacham, not like this imbecile with the pants up to the floor. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody that actually has Chokhmah, actually has Torah in his life, learned right before he left the house, the coffee spilled on him. Right before he left the house. You know, it happens. It happens. It happens. It happens to me all the time. Right before you leave the house, something has to happen. A little oil, a little state, a little that. says he still left the house. He has another shirt. It's not like it's the only shirt he has. He has another shirt, but he's like, ah, nobody's going to see it. Ah, no big deal. says he loses Olam Abba. It's very harsh. You know who said it? God. It's a problem. Why? Every one of us has done it. Thank God we're not telling me the Chachamim yet. So now what's the, why, why is this such a big deal? Hashem Barach says, you have to understand, to be a Jew, it's a big deal. That means that you're testifying that Hashem Barach is your king, and you're his son also. That means you're a prince. Or a Chabad shop, they don't like my lectures. They came to tell us who the Mashiach is again. So, It's also not allowed, by the way. Having that obnoxious music all day and night at 9 o'clock at night, you don't know who's listening, who's not listening. It's very obnoxious, and it's also not allowed. But do me a favor. Tell, tell this uh, people to stop it. There's nobody here anyway other than disturbing a shield door. This is the behavior. When the same exact thing, we're talking about the guy with the stain on his shirt. Why is he walking her out with a stain on his shirt? Because he thinks he's the only one in the world. Nah, nobody's going to care. What's the big deal? So what if they see? So what if some people are offended? So what if some... What do you mean, so what? You're the son of God. Your father is the king of kings. This is how you look? Little schlumper? Little bum? That's how you, that's how you represent God? That's what you learn from the Torah, to look like a bum? If you don't have clothes, and mamash, you're ani. Mamash, you're poor. It's a different story. Hashem put you in that situation. It's a different story. But if you're doing it by choice, just because you just don't care, because you think, ah, nobody's listening, nobody cares, nobody this, nobody this, as if you make the rules, you decide what they see. He says you have no right to live 
in Olam Abba. Why? Because the only people that make it to Olam Abba are people that think about everything. What's everything? Not just what happens in their own eyes, but what happens in the eyes of everyone else. How does everyone else look at you? Are you a righteous representation of Hashem Barach? Are you the representation of the Torah? If Hashem said to the entire world, look, here's my son. He's representing me. And they look at you with a little tchina on your shirt. You ready for that? Now, if it happened during a day, and obviously you don't have the ability to go home, it's a different story. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about accidents that happened, and you, can't, you don't have no way to rectify it. We're talking about you did it by choice. You decided that you don't care how you look. You have a problem. You have a problem. So Yaakov Avinu is saying, Hashem, just make sure I have clothes so I'm not a, a, an embarrassment to you. I'm not an embarrassment to you. If he was worried about himself, he'd say, make sure I have clothes, but three outfits of, you know, three outfits on Monday, three outfits for Tuesday, three... He didn't say that. Just make sure I have clothes. I'm not an embarrassment to you. But then he says something very interesting. He says that I return in peace to my father's house and Hashem will be a God to me. What do you mean Hashem is going to be a God to you? Who else is going to be a God to you? What do you mean I return to my father's house and Hashem, who else is going to be a God? What are you going to test out something else? What do you mean? Chazal in Midrash Rabbah explained to us, Chazal means the sages, for anyone who doesn't know, explained to us something very deep. Explained to us something that each and every single one of us needs to understand and apply. Not once a day, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. What is it? Chazal is telling us that Chazal is telling us that Yaakov Avinu was terrified of going to Lavan's house. Not because Chash Shalom is going to become a Oved Avodah Zarah like Lavan. Not because he was going to start uh, praying to J.C. Penny. Not because he was going to go uh, shopping with his kids in a supermarket for Christmas trees. Like this imbecile that I'm mamash two seconds away from mentioning his name. And mamash, it's, he's crossing every single line. Every week is a new line that he's crossing. Every week. It's mamash killing me. It's killing me that people are actually stupid enough to listen to this guy. And mamash shows us that if the Mashiach doesn't come soon, he's not going to have anyone to save. Jerry gave me hope on Sunday. Jerry, you guys saw the clip with Jerry? Jerry, Israel, he gives me hope. People like Jerry give me hope. Why? You see, the guy fought me for two and a half hours. Two and a half hours he's fighting me. Question. Ta, 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 ta. At the end, he said, okay, fine. I take on Sisi. He's taking on. He's taking on Mitzvot. 65 years old. 65 years old, he's doing tshuva. It gives me hope. It gives me hope. But on the other hand, when you have guys like this Kofer Gamu, this Mashiach Shekel, going shopping with his Jewish kids, his Jewish kids, for Christmas trees and Christmas presents. It makes fun of the whole thing. My man, like it's not a big deal. Like Christianity is not a Jewish problem. Like they didn't just release several million CDs. Several million CDs were delivered to almost every single mailbox in Israel two weeks ago. What? For missionizing all of Israel. You guys don't know about this. Several million CDs were put into mailboxes. Mailboxes. Not just that I come to a lecture, we'll give you CDs for free. No, they have $300 million a year to spend, to waste. Several million CDs were put into mailboxes of Israelis. It looks like a Shiur Torah. What Shiur Torah? It's about Yoshke. It's about Yimach Shimo V'Zichro. But that's what's happening. People don't think that Christianity is a problem. So when someone belittles it, the Gemara says, we silence him. What does it mean we silence him? They kill him. That's what they used to do in Sanhedrin. Somebody minimizes a big sin into a small sin, they kill him. Not like, oh, listen, you should stop. No, no, they kill him. Why? He obviously has no right to live. It's Mamasha Gemara. But anyway, Yaakov Avinu taught us something that if each and every single one of us 
applies to our life, Be'ezrat Hashem, we have a chance. I'm not saying we have a guarantee, but we have a chance to survive this world, whether it's through Mashiach coming very soon, Be'ezrat Hashem, or it's our time is up in this world, irrelevant. A lot of people want to focus about Mashiach coming, not coming, doesn't really make a difference. I always tell you guys that your own personal Mashiach can arrive tomorrow. So can mine. That means that Hashem decided, okay, you live 37 years in this world, okay, that's enough. Come pay the bill. Come pay the bill. 37 years, you had enough time to do tshuva, okay, what'd you do? Show me. Show me what you got. You don't need to wait for Mashiach. Everybody think, no, Mashiach, Mashiach. Well, you don't need to wait for Mashiach. My uncle, everyone was surprised. Zichon Olivachai passed away last week. You think he, every, anyone thought he was going to pass away? One day he was perfectly healthy, the next day he wasn't, the next day he died. That's it. That's how it happens. Everyone thinks they're going to get like some type of like email or text message warning. Hey, you have uh, you know, a few years left to live. Make the best of it. There's no warning. My cousin from last year, I can't stop thinking about him. I didn't even know the guy. I didn't know him. Distant cousin. 23 years old. Falls off of a scooter, dies. I can't stop thinking about the kid. Not because of him specifically, but just the fact that who thinks that a 23-year-old is going to die? I don't know, for me, maybe I'm just getting old. It just seems like I, I'm getting to know a lot more people that are dying. Finding out a lot of people that I went to high school with died. And a lot of things are happening lately. It's my mom, it's terrible. You get old, you start meeting people, and they end up going away. And you start, it gives you musar. Meaning, you got to start doing something about your own life. So Yaakov Avinu is scared. Yaakov Avinu is scared. Why is he scared? Look what happened here. Yaakov Avinu says to Hashem Barach, if I have food, if I have clothing, and if I return to my father's house, and if you remain a God to me. When does he say all this? When does he say all this? Does anyone know? After the dream. After he actually went to Yeshiva for 14 years. 14 years he went to Yeshiva. 14 years he didn't sleep like a normal person. 14 years he slept on his chair. He didn't sleep on a bed. He slept for a few minutes every day. Learned Torah non-stop. Finally, after 14 years, he leaves. Okay, now I'm ready to go meet this Lavan. Esav was terrible, but Lavan's even worse. I'm ready to meet. I learned extra Torah. He already learned 63 years of Torah. Of Torah. 63 years he already learned. He says, it's not enough. I got to learn 14 more years just to prepare myself for Lavan. For Lavan, I have to prepare another 14 years. 14 years, no sleep. After 14 years, he goes to sleep on a rock. It actually starts with a few rocks. The Midrash says that a few rocks were fighting. Who is going to be the rock that this Kodesh Kodeshim, Yaakov Avinu, is going to actually put his head on for the first time in 14 years? And miraculously, they all combined and became one rock. And that's why it says, the first time it mentions the rocks, it says rocks, plural. And when he wakes up, it says rock, stone, single stone. In the beginning it says stones, you'll see it in the uh, Stones, and then later on it says stone. Meaning that it became one stone. So from there the sages teach us that the stones miraculously combine into a single one. But what does Hashem say to him in his dream? He goes to the dream, it says that the malachim are going up and down. Because they see that Hashem already during Yaakov's life, he decided that his holiness is greater than anyone that's ever lived. And he's going to engrave his image, engrave the image of Yaakov Avinu on his throne, on Kisei HaKavod. So the Malachim are amazed at this beautiful being, wow, holy, they see him on the, they see him on the throne. But then a few th angels say, what are you looking at this? Go look at the real thing, he's sleeping, he's right down there. So they go down, Say, how did he get down here? He's over there. They go, keep going. That's what he keeps saying. They go up and down. They go up and down. Why? Because they're not sure what's which one's real. 
They go up, they see him. They go down, they see him. Olim v'yodimbo. There's a few pirushim to it. One of actually the pirushim is very scary where the malachim was saying, what is he sleeping for? We should kill him. For sleeping in his holy land. He should be learning Torah. A few, 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 few angels were very uh, serious. What are you sleeping for? But the other angel said, relax. Look, he's a Kisei Kavod. It's the first time he's sleeping in 14 years. Relax. <laughs> so anyway, after this, uh, Shemit Barach promises Yaakov Avinu. Ooh, wow, what a promise is. He promises him. Shtabach Shimol Ad, what promises. If any one of us got a, me- a text message from a friend, uh, from, a, from, a, from a mayor, from a king of, of a little town, from the, 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 the most popular kid in school, you got a nice text message, we're already happy for, for a few hours. Hashem Barach talks to Yaakov Avinu, and he promises him the world. You're going to have this, and you're going to have this, and I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you... Wow, non-stop promises. Yaakov Avinu wakes up, and us, if it was us, Start chant, do, 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 start dancing, you have the little Bukhari and dance, whatever you have. Wherever you're from, you start dancing with a dance. What does he do? He starts getting scared. He says, Yaakov Avinu, Vaira. Vaira, Vayom Arman Ora, Makom Azeh. And he became frightened and said, How awesome is this place? He agreed with the angels that said, We should kill you because you're sleeping. How could I be sleeping if this is a place that God rests in? God is here. How could I be resting? How? How could I be resting? How could I not have my mind focused on Hashem Barach at all times? How could I fail? He considered it a failure. He considered it a failure to not think about Hashem. To sleep. It's the first time he's sleeping in 14 years. How many people do you see with tefillin on their head? The direct connection we have to Hashem Barach, and instead of Talking to Hashem, praying to Hashem, crying to Hashem. What do we do? So, where do you work? Oh, how much money do you make? Oh, what are you doing after work? Oh, you want to get a couple of beers? Or oh, the jokes, or the kidding, or all those different things. All oh, stuyo nonsense I talk about. With tefillin on their head. Tefillin. The, the, you have mamash, you have, you, in essence, when you have tefillin on, why do you have tefillin on? Because you just like the, the way it looks? Why do you have tefillin on? It's a direct line to Hashem Barach. That means you believe right now, if you wear tefillin, you're supposed to believe. If you don't believe, don't put tefillin on. You believe right now Hashem's here. Not like He's far away and hopefully listens to you and maybe, and maybe. No, no, He's here now. You have tefillin in your head, Hashem is here now, listening to you. Yes, my son, what do you want? What, what do you want? You, you called me? You called me? You have tefillin on. You called me? Yes. And what do you do? What do you do? On second, Hashem. So who do you think is going to win the game tomorrow? You think? You think the Mets and the Yets and the Mets? Hashem is here. Hashem is here. T- at least take off the tefillin. At least take off the tefillin. You know how many times I see this? People talk to you all, thinking it's okay. Nah, tefillin is okay. No big deal. At least take off the tefillin. You're not even allowed. Gemara Masechet Shabbat says you're not even allowed to close your eyes. Close your eyes. Let's say you're really tired. You prayed net six o'clock in the morning. It says if you if you know you're not going to be able to survive, you're going to fall asleep with feeling on. Don't go. Don't put them on. Wait until you're awake. You're not allowed to close. You know, like this all the time. It happens. It happens. Mistake. Not on purpose. But if you know it's going to happen because you didn't sleep all night, or you know it's going to happen because you don't feel like it, or whatever, you know it's going to happen. Don't put feeling on. Wait. Why? Or what you can do is put them on really quickly, shmai side, take it off. Don't fall asleep with your tefillin. Kalvachoma, don't talk shtiyot with your tefillin on. Why? Hashem's here. Hashem's, if he's not here, why are you praying? Go pray wherever he is. If he's not here, why are you praying here? Pray somewhere else. Pray in the beginning that he showed up. But if he's here, show some respect. Yaakov Avinu had a dream. Hashem Barach promised them the world. Promised him everything you could possibly ever imagine. He gets scared. We would celebrate. I would celebrate. Personally, I'm telling you, Hashem talked to me for a second. He just says hi. He doesn't even promise me anything. He says, hey, you're on. And that's it. Conversation's over. 
I'm telling you, the next day, I'm telling you the whole story. He told me hello, and it looked that way, and the sun was this way. I'll give you five hours here just about hello. Hashem, talk to me? Who? What? Him? He gets scared. Huh? By a lot of... Not only a lie. One a lot. Hashem, talk to me. He says hello? Shh. Yaakov Avinu gets scared. Why does he get scared? Why does he get scared? Why is Yaakov Avinu so scared? You know, Rambam, in Yesudea Torah, Yilchot Yesudea Torah, gives you the number, all the details of every single one of the 613 mitzvot. 613 mitzvot. It gives you the name of every single one of the mitzvot and what it is. Don't believe in another God. It's only one God. He has no image, no likeness of an image, and so on and so forth. The fourth mitzvah, the fourth, 613 mitzvot, your fourth mitzvah, fourth mitzvah, you must fear God. Fourth mitzvah. Fourth mitzvah, you must fear God. Must fear God. Shabbat, you have to keep, you have to fear God. Same thing. There's no like, uh, it's like, oh, maybe you don't want to, you're Ashkenazi, you're Sephardic. No, we don't talk. No, no, no. It's mamash, a mitzvah from the Torah, fourth mitzvah in the entire Torah, you must fear God. So now, Yaakov Avinu is fulfilling this mitzvah. He's fulfilling the mitzvah. He fears God. And then he says, if he gives me clothes, if he gives me food, and if he stays a God to me. Well, obviously, he stays a God to you. You fear him. You're already fulfilling the Torah. What's the problem? Why wouldn't he be a God to you? Amok. Amok means deep. Chazal explained this. He says, I'm going to Lavan's house. Yaakov says, I'm going to Lavan's house. Yes, I studied Torah 14 years. Day and night I studied Torah. I did everything I possibly could. But I'm, I'm not going to go do what Lavan does, chas v'shalom. I'm not going to become a kufir. I'm not going to uh, worship idols like him. I'm not going to uh, go out with a goya. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. The problem is, when you're around sin... There's always a chance that a little dust, the little particles of sin, rub off on you. You don't become the sinner. You don't become the sinner. But a little bit rubs off on you. All of a sudden, when you have a few friends, yeah, you have a few friends, you're the tshuva. Keep Shabbat, Tarat Mishpacha, you're tzaddik. But you're still keeping a few of your old friends. And a few old friends, they still go to the clubs. They still eat a little non-kosher once in a while. Still a little on kosher once in a while. Still watch the games on the weekends. It's my friends though. I grew up with them 25 years. No, come on. What's the big deal? What's the problem? Yaakov Avinu says it's a problem. Why it's a problem? You have a little dust. A little dust of sin. A little dust of sin, my friend. A little dust of sin can destroy you. Can destroy you. Why? The little dust continues to become a cancer. Little by little, yeah, the friends, the friends, the friends, all of a sudden, you don't care so much about looking at a woman that's not your wife. All of a sudden, you protected your eyes for two years straight, but the friends came back into your life, and all of a sudden, looking at another woman, oh, yeah, you know, look at this girl, what do you think? Oh, yeah, she's okay. What? You looked? What do you mean, why are you looking? No, you know, I'm trying to be friends with them. Don't be friends with them. Be friends with God. Yaakov Avinu says the little dust of sin, that's cancer. It's cancer. And he says, I'm scared. I'm scared to have the dust of sin. Why? Who knows if maybe throughout my whole trip of being here with Lavan, maybe throughout all of this time, Esav did tshuva. Right now he's a rasha. But maybe he did tshuva while it was gone. So that, that whole thing, that whole dust of sin, that dust of sin can give him more merit than me and make Hashem allow him to kill me. The dust of sin, not the sin itself. The dust of sin. Kal v'chomer, if you become a chilul Hashem. Needless to say, if you become a chilul Hashem, if you now are an embarrassment to Hashem, you're an embarrassment to the Torah, you now have a problem. And that's what Yaakov Avinu is very scared of. So now, unfortunately, we have a lot of problems like this. A lot of people don't know some of these rules of the Torah. They don't know that Yirat Shamaim is a 
praiseworthy. They don't understand that being a Chilu Hashem is a serious problem because even suffering, even suffering in this world, as we learned, I think, last week or two weeks ago, is only the beginning of the Tshuva for Chilu Hashem. It's only the beginning of the Tshuva. And desecrating Hashem's name, unfortunately, is very easy if we don't pay attention. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 17a, says the following. What's the purpose of Torah? What's the purpose? Tachlis, what's the bottom line? What do I do with this Torah? Okay, I learned the story. It's nice. Okay, no. Chazal says, if you think that what it's written about Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, all of these, everything that's written in the entire Tanakh, if you think it's purely to give you an historical account of what happened, the Zohar Kadosh says, you have lost your right to live. You have no right to live. If you think it's a history book, you have no right to live. So what is it? It's a place you learn how to become Eved Hashem. How to become the servant of Hashem Barach. So the Gemara in Masechet Brachot says, what's the purpose of this Torah? Tshuva ma'asim tovim. Tshuva ma'asim tovim. What does it mean, tshuva ma'asim tovim? Doing tshuva and doing good deeds. What does, it, what does it actually mean? What's this good deeds? What's this tshuva? What's the outcome of tshuva and ma'asim tovim? It says, so the person does not read and learn Torah. He goes and he learns Torah. He goes to Kola, learns Torah. He goes to Bet Midrash, learns Torah. He comes to Shul once, twice, three times, four times a week, learns Torah. He learns, no problem. He has the Torah part. He says, but don't think that that's enough. Don't think that just learning this Torah is enough. What's enough? He says, make sure he's not one of those that goes and he learns Torah and at the same time, he kicks his father, his mother, and his teacher. Meaning, he has no midot. So he learned Torah, but he goes against his rabbi now. He learned Torah, but he has no respect for Ima and Abba. What's this Torah worth? What Torah? Where would you learn this Torah from? In a garbage pail? Where would you learn the Torah? What kind of Torah did you learn? What kind of Torah did you learn that told you that it's okay to celebrate a Goyish holiday? What Torah told you that? So this will answer the question of all the people that ask, are you allowed to celebrate Thanksgiving? It's coming up, and people are asking this question. Now, Moshe Feinstein, Allah Shalom, was asked, can you celebrate Thanksgiving? So he said, what's Thanksgiving? That's a Ish Kadosh. That's a Ish Kadosh. Ish Kadosh doesn't know what Thanksgiving is. What's Thanksgiving? Oh, they have turkey. So it's okay. You want to have turkey? Have turkey. No problem having turkey. What is Tavu Dazra? No. It has nothing to do with Abu Dazra. Want to have turkey? Have turkey. But that's not the question we're asking. We're not asking, are we allowed to have turkey? Because you have turkey every day of the week. No problem. Enjoy your turkey. Enjoy turkey every day. No problem. You want to boil it. You want to cook it, you want whatever you want. You want to have a sandwich with turkey. What's, that's not the question you're asking. You're not asking that. What's the question people are really asking? Can we invite our non-Jewish friends and family to our house, or can we go to their house and celebrate Thanksgiving? The Gemara in Masechet Abu Dazara says no. It says no. No, no. Doesn't matter whether it's Thanksgiving or it's a regular meal. Not allowed. Why? There's an isu of having these type of meals because chas v'shalom, you get so comfortable that you marry their daughters or their sons. You're not supposed to have meals together. So can you have turkey? Enjoy two turkeys. Enjoy the turkey. Can you have the interfaith peace? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's not my rule. It's Gemara. It's Torah. So that's the real question people are asking. And that question is answered already by the Gemara. The question they asked Rav Moshe Feinstein was a very different question. They asked him if you're allowed to eat turkey on this day. Eat two turkeys. You don't need to ask Rav Moshe Feinstein for that. 
And that's the problem with sometimes people ask questions. And they ask questions based on the way they want an answer. So I think I told you guys this last week, but it's worth saying it again. Someone goes to a rabbi and he says, Rabbi, can I um, smoke in a synagogue? Rabbi says, you crazy? What are you talking about? Tefillin, Smoke in the synagogue. This is what we're done. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He runs away. He tells his friend, look, the rabbi yelled at me. He said, I can't smoke in the synagogue. I thought maybe a little drag, something. I don't know. It's kind of hard. I... He's like, listen, you don't know how to ask a question. Watch. The other guy, tough guy, goes to the, goes to the rabbi. Kvod let me ask you a question. When I'm smoking a cigarette, can I pray at the same time to Hashem? The rabbi says, wow, ishtabach shima, what a tzaddik. Look at this guy, what a tzaddik he is. Even when he's smoking a cigarette, which is really not allowed, he's still thinking about Hashem and doing tshuva and praying to him. Look what a tzaddik, everyone. Sometimes people ask a question, not because they want the, que- the answer to the question. They already have a certain answer in mind they want, and they need somebody to sign off on it. They need somebody to sign off on their shtuyot and their nonsense. So your question is, are you allowed to have turkey? Enjoy two turkeys, three turkeys, five turkeys, with the stuffing, without the stuffing, whatever you want. Are you allowed to celebrate with your non-Jewish friends? No. Are you allowed to go to the Christmas party? No. Even if they serve you kosher food? Not allowed. Not allowed. Why? Tchilul Hashem, it's against the Torah, and there's a list of problems. We can do a whole shiur about it. So now... Unfortunately, we have some imbeciles in the world that make it like it's not a big deal. Like the guy that we talked about earlier. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Nothing's a big deal anymore. Everything is okay. Now, when we see such things, when we see things like what Lavan, a Rasha, was doing to Yaakov, if you're a normal human being, the whole time you're cheating for Hashem to kill Lavan. You read this week's parasha, it says Lavan cheated Yaakov over a hundred times. A hundred times he cheated him on money. A hundred times. We made a deal, signed off on a deal, signed off on a contract. Lawyers, this, that, everything. Next day, no, no, I don't agree. What do you mean, but you signed off? No, no, I don't agree. It's something else. I didn't, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it. Okay, let's do it again. Another green. You can understand this? Small print, big print. The print is... 72 font. Ready? You understand? Everything is good? Yeah, everything is good. Okay. Next day? No, no, no. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. And again, every day. Every day. Every day, he's stealing from him. The whole, if you're a normal human being, you're praying for Hashem. Just kill the guy already. Yaakov Avinu, Kodesh Kodeshim. Kill no, Kill the guy. At least Yaakov kill him. Somebody kill him. So you see some of these people, such reshaim, you want to pray for them to die. You pray for them to die. The Gemara says that there was a bunch of gangsters bothering Rabbi Mir Balanes. Rabbi Mir Balanes, and he started, every day they would torture him. Every day. And he started praying for them to die, and his wife rebuked him. His wife said, when David Melech in uh, Psalm 104, he didn't say, May Hashem end all of the Reshaim, may he destroy all the Reshaim. It says, May Hashem destroy all the sins, not the Reshaim. Meaning you're supposed to pray for people to do tshuva, not for them to die. She rebuked her own husband, Rabbi Mir Baranes, Tana Kadosh. He says, Tzadkami Meni. She's right. She's right. So after, at the end of the parasha, when Lavan goes after Yaakov Avinu, and the whole ordeal happens. He chases him down. He says, why'd you steal my God? His grandsons, the 12, uh, the 12 tribes, all start laughing. Like, hey, Grandpa, why don't you find a God that nobody can steal? The Midrash start, they start laughing at him. Like, Abba, yeah, why, why is this God, like, stealable? Why don't you find a real God that's not stealable? Someone stole your God? They start laughing. Little kids. The little kids understood. Five, six years old, they understood. Their grandfather's an idiot. They understood, but he's like, why did you steal my God? So he says, okay, you know what? Go, look, look through everything. Look through everything new. If you find it, whoever, whoever took it should die. This is a problem. This is a mistake he made. This was the only mistake he made. 
But anyway, after Lavan goes through all of this stuff, and right now, I'm thinking, what's happening? He's going through the diapers. He's going through the clothes. He's going through the tents. He's going through the women's stuff, to the kids' stuff. He's going through everything. He's got every single thing he's going through. You know how annoying that is? You know how embarrassing that is? One time I went to a flight. I think one of the, sh- one of the lecture tours that we were doing, uh, maybe like eight, nine months ago. And uh, Hashem would have it. I did some type of sin in my life that I deserve this. So at the airport, I happened to have this... I mean, the guy had to be homosexual. Had to be. I mean, aside from his behavior, he, I go through the security check. He's like, oh, we have to check you. Okay, I mean, it's how I've, I've flown Baruch Hashem in many, many places. Whatever, it's not the first time. Fine, whatever. Want to check? Check, no problem. I went to the machine. Well, you want to check? Oh, no, no, I have to check. I have to check. Okay, check. The guy started patting me and going through the pockets and this and that to such an extreme... To such an extreme. First of all, it felt extremely uncomfortable. Somebody touching you. It's mamash disgusting. But it's such an extent that the other people started looking. They're like, what's wrong with this guy? They're starting to look at me like, like the guy mamash was going to camp. Disgusting. Disgusting human being. But imagine somebody going through your stuff. How uncomfortable that is. You know how uncomfortable? Disaster. Levan goes to Yaakov Avinu's stuff, his wife's stuff, his di- everything. At the end, Yaakov at Sadiq says to Levan, me, I would tell Levan, no, go kill yourself now. You didn't find anything, right? Go kill yourself now. What do you want from my life? Go away. What does Yaakov say? No, show me what you find. If you found something, show me. She says, I didn't find nothing. So Yaakov says to him, what did I do so wrong? What did I do so wrong? He says, Yaakov got upset. We get upset. We start breaking things. Yaakov gets upset. He says, he gets upset. He says, what did I do so I could fix it? What did I do? What did I do so I could fix So I could do tshuva? This Rasha Merusha Lavan cheated him a hundred times. Lied to him. Lied to him about the first wife. Lied to him about, about money. Lied to him about every single thing. Everything he could possibly, even his name was a lie. Lavan is not really his name. Shachol, they should call him. Black. Everything was a lie. Everything was a lie. He says, listen, what did I, Yaakov, says, listen, what did I do? I'll fix it. I'll fix it. See, from Yaakov Avinu, lo pashut liot yudi pashut. It's not simple to be a simple Jew. It's not simple to be Yaakov Avinu. Can't lose your temper. You can't just uh, celebrate when your enemy falls. But in the world we live in today, celebrating when your enemy falls seems like it's one of the pleasures left in this world. (laughs) Celebrating when your enemy falls seems like it's like a gift from God. (laughs) Now here's the problem. Shmuel HaKatan, this Mishnah, tells us a secret that can actually be a reason of why some of us are actually suffering. Shmuel HaKatan Omer, B'nfo lo evecha al tismach, U'bikashlo al yagel yibecha, P'nirei Adonai v'ra b'enav, V'eshiv me'alav apo. Shmuel HaKatan says, When your enemy falls, do not be glad. And when he stumbles, let your heart not be joyous, lest Hashem see, and it displease him, and he tur- turns his wrath from him to you. So first and foremost, you know that this actual Mishnah it's not an original Mishnah like the other Mishnayot that we've read where it was actually a saying of the actual sage that said it, whether it be Rabbi Akiva or Rabbi Lazar and so on and so forth. They would say all these different divrei chokmah. Shmuel HaKatan actually took a pasuk from the Torah. He took a pasuk from the Torah. He took a verse from the Torah, Proverbs 24, chapter 24, verse 17 to 18. 
two psukim in the Torah, and he says, this is it. This is my life. That's how he lived, based on this pasuk. That, based on this pasuk. He says, don't celebrate when your enemy falls. Don't even be happy when your enemy falls. Because that can lead Hashem to be upset to such an extent that he could take his entire anger that he has on this person that he's punishing right now and put it on you, Chas v'shalom. This just turned our entire world upside down. Anyone that understands what we just said, it just turned our reality upside down. Why? Because like I said, in the world we live in today, it almost seems like we are, it's like one of the pleasures in the world. You have, let's say, sex, money, uh, I don't know, whatever else there is in this world, food. And then you think, pleasure for my enemies falling. You think it's like one of like the top, greatest things like Hashem can give me a gift, see my enemies fall. There's even like you said, there's zgulot, there's teilim, there's specific teilim that you read. One of the teilim is different, there's a book I have, it says, you know, you want, you want to pray for certain things, you want to read teilim for certain things to happen, certain things, you know, certain zgulah, there's actually teilim for your enemies to fall. But here Shmuel HaKatan says, if you celebrate your enemies falling, you're doing the worst possible thing you can possibly do. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Bava Kama, page 93, says, Gemara Bava Kama says, Anyone who wishes punishment, wishes bad on his friend, on another, gets punished first. You say, hey, look, Hashem, look at this Rasha, he's a Mechalel Shabbat, kill him right now. Look at this Rasha, he's stealing from his customers, kill him right now. Look at this Rasha, he's having an ex mess party, even he's always a Jew. Kill him now, Hashem. Gemara says, what you said goes to Shemaim. Goes to Shemaim. The angels come to Hashem. Hashem, look. Tzvika over here said that this other guy, uh, Drol, is a Rasha. Look what he did. Look what he did. Oh, hold up. Before we look at Drol, let's look at Tzvika. Tzvika, let's, he's asking for something. Okay, let's see if we should listen to him. Let's see if we should listen to him. Before we punish Drol, because maybe Dor is actually a Rasha. But before we look at Dor's account, let's look at Tzvika. Let's look at Shmuli. Let's look at, he brought this case to us. He's the prosecutor. Let's, let's see who's, who's actually bringing the case. Is he clean? Or is he like a gangster telling on his friend so he can clean the market? You know, sometimes the gangsters, they think they're smart. They tell on their friends, on their competition. They figure the cops arrest this guy. Therefore, I have the entire market. Little than all, the other guy already told on them. But so he's like, so in Shemaim they say, no, who are you? You're a prosecutor. Where do we learn this from? We learned this two weeks ago. We learned this from Sarai Menu. Sarai Menu tells Avraham, let Hashem be a judge between you and I. They got to fight. Let Hashem be a judge between you and I. And the very next parasha, Parashat Chaye Sarah. We learn, Sarah died first. Why? Shemaim, they said, don't say, let's see who's, who's right, who's wrong. Don't be a uh, ordin, a uh, attorney, a lawyer for Hashem. Don't be a judge for Hashem. Don't say such things like, look, Hashem, who's, you know, whoever's right, bring the deen on him. No, why? They're going to look at you first. Before they look at him, they look at you first. So Shmuel HaKatan takes this pasuk from the Torah. He says this is dangerous. How dangerous is this though? How dangerous is this? Now all of you, I'm hoping, the men at least, are learning Torah every day. Some of you, Baruch Hashem, have gotten to the point where you're starting to learn Gemara. Masechet Brachot Skain, 
It hasn't come to me in the dream the last couple of days. I'm hoping it's... So, no, because I learned a little bit of so it was maybe because it wasn't crying, because I was learning for you. I'm not so sure. So anyway, it says, how dangerous is this? Celebrating the fall of your enemy. We're not talking about the fall of your friend. We're not talking about the fall of your friend. Fall of your friend, obviously, you're, just, uh, you're not really his friend. If you're celebrating for your friend to fall, what kind of friend are you? What a friend like you who needs enemies. We're talking about celebrating your enemy falling. Your enemy falling. What if? No, we're talking about Jews. We're talking about Jews. So now, Shmuel Katan is saying this is something that must be a pasuk, not only in a Torah. Not only, in case you missed it, in case you only read the five books of Moses and you just started Joshua. You just started Yeshua. You just started the, uh, after Yeshua ben Nun took over. You're not up to Proverbs yet. You're not up to the Nevi'im yet. You're not up to Tehillim. You're not up to it yet. You haven't gotten to it yet. But listen, you have to learn Musa, right? So you learn Pekei Avot. He says, you have to understand, we've actually took a pasuk from the Torah and he lowered it. Why? Torah is the highest. But now you have, he made it a part of the oral Torah also. He says, you must learn this and make this a klal in your life. Why? It's dangerous. Why do you mean it's dangerous? How dangerous is this? How dangerous is this? In the Gemara, Masechet Brachot, page 28, it actually says something very scary. It says, before you learn your Gemara, they asked, Rabbi Nechunya, Ben Akana, what do you do? Before you learn Torah, you know, we see that you pray before you come in uh, the Bet Midrash, and you pray when you leave. What's this prayer that you do? What's this prayer that you do? He says, before I, before I actually start learning, I say, I pray to Hashem, Please, Hashem, let not any mishap happen through me which will cause my colleagues to celebrate. Meaning, my failure will cause my colleagues to celebrate. And let not my colleagues not fail, for I be joyous that they failed. And this is actually a... The Rambam was actually, was actually saying in Ilchot Shuva, chapter 8, Alakha 5, he says he's surprised. Why is he surprised? He's surprised that they didn't actually write at the end of this, this is actually Allah. This is a law. It's not a minag to pray these prayers. It's actually Allah. You must do it. Because the Shulchan Aruch 1108, the Bet Yosef, put it as Allah. Ruled as Allah. So what you have in the Pretty much every single Gemara, regardless of who wrote it, you have this blessing that usually goes on the, uh, on, the, uh, you know, on the cover, which says exactly what I just said with a few other additions to it. It says, you must say, Hashem, may it be your will that a mishap does not happen through me, meaning that you don't get to the wrong conclusion and make the wrong halakha, make the wrong decision, not because of just the sin that you're going to make as a result of your mistake. Not because of that. But because your failure can lead your colleagues. I'm not talking about just your enemies. I'm talking about your colleagues, other people. They're in the Bet Midrash to be happy. You failed. Let it not happen. Why? Why is it one? Why is it a beginning? This, this is actually in every Gemara. In every Gemara. Why? Why is it in every Gemara? The Rambam puts it another level. He says it's so important to know this that he wrote it in two Sfarim in his Alachot. In Mishneh Torah, it's both in Ilchot Shuva and Ilchot Deot. Two places. And it's also in the Gemara Bavli and Yerushalmi. 
this principle that you probably never heard of of not being happy when your enemy falls is actually in Gemara, Bavli, in several places, not just Brachot. It's in Yerushalmi. It's in the Shulchan Aruch. It's in a Rambam in two books. But most of us never heard it. Why? We thought it's fun. Great, look, Hashem is punishing my enemies. Baruch Hashem. You want to say Kaddish? They brought it on themselves. It's their fault. The Shaim. Right? You want to celebrate. The Rambam says the following. In Ilchot Tshuva, chapter 3, Alakha 14, our sages said that a person who frequently commits these sins, you know, mentioned several different sins, has no Olam Abba. Loses Olam Abba. You can keep Shabbat, Tarat Mishpacha, give Tzedakah. Well, he's a nice guy. Wonderful. Goes to the Knesset, has Tfilin, Rashi, Rabbeinu Tam, Lulav is uh, six feet tall, whatever. He does these different sins, no Olam Abba. No Olam Abba. Now one of the sins, Malbim Pnei Chavero Berabim. He embarrasses his friend in public. Sees a Jew, comes to him asking for tzedakah. He says, hey, go get a job. He's skinned. The guy is already suffering. doesn't have any money already. He's struggling for money. On top of it, you're yelling at him like he's a bum. Like he doesn't have a neshama. Like he's not the son of the same king. You're just embarrassing him in public. He says, that guy has no Allah but we already learned this from David HaMelech. What's the chidush? Chidush is the very following. The very following sin is one who takes pride in another person's shame. Someone who takes pride in another person's shame has no olam abba. Shem rachem. What does it mean? Someone takes pride in another person's shame. So he explains it actually in the other book in Ilchot Deot. Ilchot Deot, chapter 3. Alakha. Chapter 6, Alakha 3. We'll get there in a moment. It's all live. Says anyone who gains honor to the degradation of a colleague does not have a share in the world to come. What's the chidush here? What does it mean? Is that he builds his reputation by emphasizing his colleague's flaws. He's a terrible speaker. He's not as smart as me. He made a mistake last year. He did, he that. He says, you celebrate that now they all discovered that he's a rasha. They all discovered that he made a mistake. They all discovered all these different things. And through that, you're celebrating that he fell. You're celebrating that he lost everything. You have made such a big problem for yourself that now instead of saying Kaddish on his career, you have to say Kaddish on your own Olam Abba. You have a problem. So Shmuel Akatan says, this is such a big deal, we have to turn this into a Mishnah. We have to make it into a Mishnah. We have to put it in the Gemara. We have to put it in Shulchan Aruch. We have to put it in the Rambam. We have to put it everywhere you can. Why? Because it's so easy to fail. Because our natural inclination tells us the opposite. Our natural inclination wants us to celebrate when our enemy fails. We're not talking about celebrating when our friends fail. We're talking about celebrating where our enemies fail. He's an enemy. Why shouldn't I celebrate? Maybe Hashem is rewarding me by punishing him. Why not? Different story. Different, different, different story. We'll get to it in a second. I'm saying it for a reason. 
So first and foremost, before we delve into this deep, right now we just realized that we have an atomic bomb in our hands, and we may be the one that get explode. So, who's the Shmuel Katan? They just rocked our life and told us that everything we've taught, everything we knew, everything we behaved like is wrong. We thought we already did tshuva. We just realized we're just starting. We thought we did tshuva. We just realized we're starting right now, today. Today is the first day of tshuva. Thank you. How, how are you? Thank you, Hashem, for giving me enough time to do tshuva. What happened? Shmuel Katan just rocked our world. Why? He just told us we're not allowed to celebrate when our enemies fail. We thought it's one of the pleasures of life. So first and foremost, why is he called Shmuel Katan? The Gemara says, if you make a nickname for your friend, you have no Olam Abba. Say Malacha. Say Malacha says you make a nickname for your friend, even if he's okay with it. You have no Olam Abba. Why are you making fun of him? Maybe you're embarrassing him in public every day for the rest of his life. No, it's Danny the fat guy. He's okay with being the fat guy. It doesn't matter if he's okay with being the fat guy. You can't call him a name. But here, this name wasn't a nickname. This was a reality. Shmuel Katan was called Shmuel Katan by all of the sages because of his humility. In the Gemara in uh, Yerushalmi, Masechet Sota, says a couple of reasons why he was called Shmuel Katan. One of them was because of how humble he was. How humble he was. In Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, page 11, talks about how Rabban Gamliel called a last-minute hearing to decide on a leap year. To decide on a leap year. Not like today where they know when, who, and what, all the clock and everything that we have technology-wise. They decide on a leap year, and Allah says that you have to have the uh, judges, has to be seven judges have to be present and all decide and so on and so forth. So he makes, calls, he has his uh, assistant notify the seven judges to appear the next day. The next day, eight judges show up. Now they're all Kedoshim. They're not like just eight common people. They're all from the Sanhedrin. Every one of them is holy to the next. But it's eight people. Rabban Gabriel says the Allah is seven people. Whoever was not invited must leave right now. Shmuel Katan stands up. Says, I'm the one that showed up without an invitation. I just want to learn halacha. I just want to learn halacha. I want to learn from you guys. It's Kodesh Kodeshim. I want to learn from you guys. The Gemara says, it really wasn't him. Rabban Gamliel learns later on, he says actually to him, in front of everyone, it's not you, Shmuel. We know. Why? You're so righteous and so good, it's better that the whole judgment for every single year, leap year until the end of the world is based on whatever you say. We don't need seven judges, just you. So of course he was invited. But no, no, I wasn't. I wasn't invited. I wasn't invited. I wasn't invited. It's me. It's me. It's me. Why do you say I'm not invited? I have to leave. Okay, I'm going to leave. Thank you, guys. I have to leave. Why? Why? Shmuel Katan says, somebody made a mistake. Somebody made a mistake. And a person that wasn't invited, now he's going to get up. He's going to be embarrassed. He's going to be embarrassed. You get embarrassing a person. Let me be embarrassed. Minimize me. Let me. Why? Who am I to not be embarrassed? Let me be embarrassed than one of the children of God. Why, you're not a child of God? No, no, I'll be embarrassed. That's Shmuel Katan. Shmuel is small. Why? He minimized himself. Minimized himself. And Yerushalmi says, Why Shmuel Katan? Because they constantly compared him to Shmuel Navi. They didn't compare him to Rabban Gamliel. Kodesh Kodeshim. But he's not Shmuel Navi. They didn't compare him to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva. But he's not Shmuel Navi. Who Shmuel Navi? Shmuel Navi saw and throne, put the throne on the first two kings of Israel, Shaul and David. Shmuel Navi, the Torah says, was at the level in his generation of both Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron Cohen together. Shmuel. 
And Shmuel Katan is saying, there's a but call from Shemaim. It's not the people's opinion. Oh, we like him. He's such a nice guy. No. A but call from Shemaim came out to the Sanhedrin. Says there's someone among you. There's someone among you that has the merit and the righteousness to have the Shekhinah rest on him. Meaning, become a prophet. But the problem is, the generation is not righteous enough. It doesn't have the merits to have such a prophet. He has the merit. He has the Kedusha. He has the ability. But the rest of the generation doesn't have the merit. What did they all do? They all looked at Shmuel. It's him. Shmuel, Shmuel Katan. It's him. It has to be him. It's not us. It's not me. Rabban Gamliel. Everybody. Kodesh Kodeshim. Every one of them can revive the dead. No, it's not me. It's not me. It's Shmuel Katan. It has to be him. We see the bigger a person is in reality, in the eyes of Hashem, the smaller they make themselves. Now, Rabban Gamliel had a problem in those days. A problem that unfortunately, 2,000 years later, we are actually still dealing with and that problem is, is that Christianity was born around that time and the original members were Jews were heretics Jews some people like to say that it was based on the Sadducees but it's not the real Gemara the original copies are saying it's actually there was a lot of heretics that went to Christianity and they tried recruiting, missionizing other Jews, ignorant Jews. That's how Christianity was born. It was based on ignorant Jews. It wasn't, it wasn't founded by Tamidei uh, Chachamim, by scholars. A bunch of ignorance. They even say it themselves. Even the Christians say it themselves. A bunch of illiterates, ignorant people. It's not a secret. They say it themselves. People didn't know how to read, didn't know how to write. Just tell them something, okay, fine. The cow's the same thing. No different. They say it themselves. I didn't make this up. It's not, it's not a matter of like making fun of it. Oh, and by the way, the whole J.C. Penny being God, being Mashiach, being stuff like that, to make fun of it is a mitzvah from the Torah. One of the 613 mitzvot is to make fun of idol worship. We also learn this in the Gemara Masechet Megillah. You're going to get to it, Bezal Hashem. Page 25. 25b. 25b says mitzvah from the Torah to make fun of idol worship. You're not allowed to make fun of anything else. Can't be a joker. Why? Because Gemara Masechet Abu Dazara says, for the jokers, the people who like to make jokes, their beginning is suffering, their end is destruction. Hashem hates jokers. He hates people saying, in the middle of the shiur, start throwing a joke for no reason. Hates it. Why? You ruin the whole shiur. Don't be a joker. Be a serious person. You could joke when the right time to joke. Fine. But there's only one thing you're allowed to joke at any time. What? Against idol worship. That mitzvah, mitzvah from the Torah. Mitzvah from the Torah to make fun of idol worship. Mitzvah from the Torah to make fun of Christianity. Mitzvah from the Torah to make fun of all that stuff. Mitzvah. Mitzvah from the Torah to make fun of all these people that say the uh, Rebbe is God or Rebbe is uh, or some type of idol that they've made into it. He was a tzaddik. He's not God. It's mitzvah. Mitzvah from the Torah to make fun of it. It's not like uh, my opinion. Mitzvah from the Torah. Now, Rabban Gamliel knew that there's a serious problem here. The problem here is that you have a bunch of ignorance being recruited by these missionaries. He says we need to make an extra prayer as Klali Sailas together. As all of us, we have to make a prayer. We have to pray for Hashem to save us from these Rishayim. We have to pray to Hashem to save us because what, we're going to monitor every single person, what he does when the lights go off, what he does when the, when the doors are closed. We can't. We have to pray to Hashem to give us, to help us. So who has the skill and the kedusha and the knowledge to write an extra prayer? He says, Shmuel HaKatan. Shmuel HaKatan has the ability to write an extra prayer and we'll add it to our Amidah prayer. Our Amidah prayer, if you notice, it's also called Tefilat Shmona Tefilat Shmonaisa means the prayer, 18 prayers. But if you actually count how many prayers Tefilat Shmonaisa has, it has 19. 
Why do we still call it 18 then? Because Chazal says that's the tradition, we stay by the tradition. Tradition, it's called Tefillat Shemona we keep it Tefillat Shemona even though it's well known, there's 19 prayers. Now they said, Shmuel Katan, you need to add a prayer. What's this prayer? This prayer is called Laminim V'Malshinim. Laminim V'Malshinim, Amin. Amin is someone that we learned about, I think it's Shior number 29 or 28, when we're talking about this... Uh, uh, BRS wanted to bring a, a missionary to their shul. So we talked about all the details of the minim. You're not allowed to be within six feet of them. If they write a Sefer Torah, it's a mitzvah from the Torah to burn it. If you find a uh, New Testament, even if it has Hebrew, the writings of Hashem's name, you're allowed to burn it, and it's a mitzvah to burn it, even if it's Hashem's name. Why? If someone like that wrote Hashem's name, it's not considered Hashem's name. It's considered nothing. So, the minim, some people think that they could only be Jews. I mean, by definition, as someone that recruits a person, recruits a Jew away from Judaism, brings them to Christianity, brings them to Buddhism, brings them to Islam, brings them to somewhere else, brings them to atheism, brings them to be a Michalel Shabbat, actively takes people away from God. That's a mean. Now, some people, even learned people, believe that you could only be a mean if you're a Jew. This is a hundred percent error. A mean is both a Jew and a non Jew. Both a Jew and a non Jew. So the Birkat Aminim was tasked by Rabban Gamliel specifically to go fight against the early Christians because they began to flourish. And they started campaigning to enlist the Romans, the evil Romans, to start persecuting the Jews. They figured whoever is not going to join us by religion, let's have the Romans kill them. So Rabban Gamliel knew that this is a serious problem. This, 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 these heretics are a serious problem for Am Yisrael. And yet Shmuel Katan add a prayer. So every time you say, Laminim ve Lamal Shinim, Prayer in your Amidah, this is why. Not just for the minimum of Malshinim that existed 2,000 years ago. For the ones today. So for all those people that are contemplating, what, should I go celebrate Thanksgiving with my Christian friends that are missionaries? Just know, we pray every day for them to die. I'm not joking. If they're a regular, normal Christian person, that's just wrong. No problem, we have no problem with them. Could be even a lover of Israel. But if he's trying to recruit people, trying to recruit Jews to Christianity, we pray for him to die. Because that's what he's, in essence, what he's trying to do is to kill Jews as far as spiritually, which is worse than physically. There's this one guy, I don't know his name, but he makes a lot of videos, a lot of pro-Israel videos, young kid, young kid, I don't know, probably in his 20s. Looks like he's in his 20s. A lot of pro-Israel uh, videos, but then it was recently uh, uh, announced, I don't know whether he uh, wrote an article himself or somebody exposed, I'm not really sure what happened, but I'm pretty sure actually he, he did something, he did a video saying that all of these pro-video, this pro-Israel videos that he's been doing because everyone thinks he's Israeli, meaning he's a Jew. Sounds like it, acts like it, talks like it, everything sounds fine. Things like this. You know, he's not, he's not an American. So everyone thought, okay, this guy's a Jew. Maybe not a religious Jew, but he's a Jew. And uh, became very popular. Like many, many, tens of thousands of hits on every one of his uh, videos. And he actually made a video. Now I remember, he made a video. I didn't watch the video, but I saw an article about the video. I mean, it's only 10 seconds of the video. And uh, he says his whole game plan... His whole game plan of what he's doing is to bring Christianity to the Jews. This whole pro-Israel, I love Israel, Israel is great, stop attacking her, Palestinians are wrong, BDS is terrible, Rishayim, Rishayim, all that stuff, it's all, not, it's all part of a grand plan to destroy Am Akadosh, Am Israel. That's what Islam does, 
Yeah, Islam at least is not idol worship like uh, like a uh, Christianity is. But aside from that, they don't hide it like they do. It's not idol worship. It's different that it's your opinion that it's idol worship. There's a couple of other people that say it's idol worship, but it's not idol worship. According to the Rambam, it's not idol worship. But regardless of whether it is or it's not, it's still heresy. It's still against the Torah. And the reality is, is that they don't hide it, though. The problem with the missionaries is that they hide it. Whether it's Messianic Judaism, which is a.k.a. Christianity 101, or it's this pro-Israel Rasha, or all these other different things. Unfortunately, we live in a generation where Am Israel, apparently we've made so many sins that we've become stupid. That not only is the enemy not fighting us and still winning, we're actually opening the door for them. You have many religious leaders. We're not even just talking about the secular people that are anti-religion and hate religious Jews anyway. Not talking about that. Talking about religious Jews. Talking about rabbis. Many rabbis somehow, some way, are befriending the Christians and even having different events with them, different uh, organizations with them, different deals with them. And Mamash, they're letting the wolf inside the house and showing him where the sheep are. They're showing where where the sheep sleep. It's really, Mamash, you start looking at this guy. He's like, wait, this is not an Ama'aretz, an ignorant Jew. This is not a non-religious Jew, an atheist Jew. No, talk about, talk about, this is a rabbi. This is a guy that actually learned some Gemara in his life. This is a guy that got a smicha maybe. This is a guy that knows Chumash, knows Moshe. No, he knows Torah. You're the one that's going to actually lead the wolf to eat the sheep? You're showing them where they sleep? Are you stupid? Is something wrong with you? Have you read the Amidah prayer three times a day for the last 50, 60 years? Do you know what you're reading? Do you know that we pray for that specific person to die every day and you're letting him into our house? What happened? What is wrong with these people? It's like almost like they've all learned Torah in the same garbage. I have no idea where they where, where do you learn these things are allowed. For some reason, it seems like I'm one of very few people. There's Baruch Hashem, others, but very few people realize that Christianity is a bigger problem today than it's ever been. At least two thousand years ago, they killed us. That was a favor. I'm not advocating the, the, the murder of Jews, chas v'shalom, but to kill a body is better than killing a soul for eternity. Convert or die. Okay, die. Okay, at least you have olam haba. Baruch Hashem. You have olam haba. You have a great olam haba. You died for that. At least they told you. Convert. No, you don't want to believe in idol. You don't want to believe in uh, Yoshke that uh, died and this and that, all that nonsense that we made up. You want to believe in it? No. Okay, we'll kill you. Okay, fine. Baruch Hashem. Israel, I'm next to Rabbi Akiva. So no problem. Apparently, people don't realize that today, when you're letting him into the house, you're letting him into the house, and you tell him, no, you can teach in our Bate Knesset, you can teach in our uh, community, you can give out your CDs and your books, you can have the pro-Israel programs, the Jewish Federation, and the APAC, and the zip pack, and the garbage pack, and this pack, and that pack, and you can pack all the nation together and make them Christians? What? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? Do you realize this is part of your tefillah three times a day? Is, any, is there anyone left in the world that actually understands what he says in tefillah? Laminim velamalshinim, it talks about them. And you're letting them in. No, no, they donated $20 million to our cause. No, they donated $20 million to go into the house. They care less about your cause. Because your cause, they know themselves is doing nothing anyway. I don't understand. What happened? Have we all become so stupid, so blind? This is what's left? Yeah. Um, 
very says, um, when I speak to you and you say, okay, I'm going to do it, but really you have in the back of your head, no, I'm not going to convert. If you're going to say convert, so you still do. If you have to do a thing, you run away from him. The Rambam says, if a goy tells you, you have a mean ag. Pay attention, guys. You have a mean ag. We're not talking about Chilul Shabbat. If he says, violate Shabbat, or I'll kill you, if it's just you and him, you're allowed to violate Shabbat. If it's in front of people, you're not allowed to do it. If he says, go kill another person, or i kill you, die. If he says, go worship this uh, J.C. Penny, or i kill you, die. If he says, go rape this girl or I kill you, die. If he says, go have sex with a girl you're not allowed to have sex with, die. But if he says, if he says, no, there's no fighting back. Fighting back has a gun. There's no fighting back. We're not talking about fighting back. Fighting back is not an argument. Okay, so fight back. That's not, then it's not a question. There's not a question. We're, not, we're talking about a place, a, a situation where there's no option. We're saying there's a If you have an option, then fight, obviously. We're talking about a place you have no option. He puts a gun to your head and he says, go worship J.C. Penny. Says, no, shoot, please. Thank you. I'll get a Go, uh, you know, a, uh, kill somebody. Shoot, please. On the other temple, too. Make sure. Shoot. But that's if it's private. If it's private, if it's one on one, it's private. There's only three things you die for. Rest of it, you're allowed to sin. If it's private. If it's public, Listen to this very carefully. We're at the end of times. Nothing's off limits. I don't wish bad. It's just a reality we're living in. If it's public, if there are people, 5, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, 1,000 Jews, whatever it is, you see there's Jews out there, and he says, listen, don't murder anyone. Don't worship Yoshke. Don't have sex with a woman you're not to have sex with. No, no, no. You have a minag. You have a minag. You have a custom. In your tradition, you're Yemenite, you're Ashkenazi, you're Sephardi, whatever. You guys have a minag that you tie uh, extra shoes. You tie your shoes twice. You tie it, and untie it, and then you tie it again. I just created a minag out of nothing. Don't make this. It's not a real minag. I created a minag. Tomorrow you're going to see everybody start tying their shoes three times. No, no, it's not a minag. I created it, I created it out of nothing. But he says, you have a minag. You have a minag. You have a custom. A minag. I want you to break that minag. You say, kill me please. Minag. Not alakha. Minag. Why? It's faresia. It's chilu Hashem. Die for Hashem. So you have to understand that when we let these... Huh? It's not a minag then. A minag means that it actually has its chutavot. It's, it's something that's already lived with us for hundreds of years. Not something that some guy created last week. It's not a minag. That's just, he's crazy and bored. No, we're talking about something that are avot. That's connected to our ancestors. That's connected to our heritage. It's connected to our being. Uh, then that's something we're, we're not allowed to violate in, in public. And that's a chilu Hashem. So now... Shmuel Katan was tasked with a big task. Go make a prayer to ask Hashem to help us. Ask Hashem to help us fight these people. Because we can't beat them by ourselves. In those days, unfortunately, we didn't have the physical power. Today, we neither have the physical power nor the spiritual power. Now, why do they pick Shmuel Katan? Why do we pick Shmuel Katan? Because Shmuel Katan lived by this Mishnah. This Mishnah does not mean that. You're supposed to cheer for your enemy to win. This Mishnah does not mean that you become a sucker either, a fool. No, it's not a Mishnah to be a fool. This Mishnah means that the only thing you're worried about, the only thing you're concerned about is Kvod Hashem. 
The only thing that matters to you is Kvod Hashem. Everything that happens, happens because Hashem signed off on it. If your enemy fail, Hashem did it. Why? It's his cheshbon. It's not for me. You don't become one of these people that turns chas v'shalom, Hashem into your servant. Oh, look, Hashem did it for me. He made this guy die because of me. Why? Who are you? Who are you that he did it for you? What makes you so special? What, Hashem works for you? Chutzpan. Hashem made him fail. Hashem made him lose. Why? For you? Why? Why, that righteous? Hashem is working for you? Moshe Rabbeinu was scared to ask Hashem for certain things. He was scared when Korach was going against him. And you, Hashem works for you. He kills people. He makes them lose money for you. Why? Who are you? Shmuel the Katan says, start off being a Katan. Minimize yourself. Destroy your gava. In your Amidah prayer, just so you know, the original 18, the original 18 prayers... We know them because we have the name of Hashem mentioned 18 times in Tehilim 29. Tehilim 29, you'll see, it's a special Tehilim that David HaMelech wrote, and he mentions Hashem's name. It's uh, praising Hashem and Avu uh, Hashem Ben Tehilim. We read it on Yom Shishi. We read it on, on Friday uh, before Shabbat. And... Um, He's honoring Hashem. And a Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 32, says that this is actually one of the biblical sources that we actually get the 18 prayers from. The fact that there's 18 prayers of honoring Hashem. But in addition to that, there's also in Kriyat Shema, Shema Yisrael, and the whole, the, all the paragraphs from Shema Yisrael all the way until the end of uh, Hashem Elokeinu, uh, Hashem Emet, in there, you'll see also the name of Hashem mentioned 18 times. But now there's also, in both of these places, there's not only, there's one other word, which is God, El. And that is, in essence, the replacement, the additional extra prayer that that uh, Shmuel HaKatan added. So already in prophecy, it was already written in the Torah that it's going to be this Tefillat Shemona Yisrael, this Amidah that has 18 prayers, that's called 18 prayers, is going to have 19. Hashem already knew that there's going to be a problem when He created the world. Obviously. Now, a lot more details. Mara Masechet Yibrachot, page 28. B and 29A. Very interesting things about it. So Shmuel Katan, the Shechina said that he has mamash the merit to be a prophet at a generation that there's no prophecy. And before he died, he actually did give a prophecy. And he told all of his friends, Rabbi Akiva, and the rest of them, Rabban Gamliel, and the rest of them, he told them they're all going to die. Very brutal deaths. By who? By the very same enemy they've been praying against for all of these years. These very same heretics, these very same Christians, these very same Romans that have been torturing Am Yisrael, in the end, they're going to kill them. When he died, Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah said that because he didn't have any children, he said when a king dies, usually he leaves the kingdom and the wealth to his son, to a prince. When a wealthy person leaves the world, he leaves their money and their success to their heirs, kids, grandkids, and so on. Shmuel HaKatan took all that's desirable in this world with him. Meaning, he's the only thing that was any good in this world. The fact that he left, 
He took everything that's good in this world. They lived in a very, very difficult time. So now Shmuel HaKatan made the, a habit of quoting this verse from the Torah And they say to say, why particularly this verse? Why did Shmuel Katan? why was he perfect for writing this prayer? The reason why is because he had not an ounce of animosity towards anyone. He wasn't writing the prayer out of anger. He wasn't saying this verse out of anger. He was saying it as an honor for Hashem Barach. Meaning, forget about me, forget about them, forget about anything. What does Hash- what's good for Hashem? What's good for Hashem? Now he would, he was known to be a rebuker. Give musar to who? To people that would celebrate when their next door neighbor just declared bankruptcy, when the competition just shut down, or when they lost money. Or when the journalist wrote a bad story about them. He says, hey, by the way, you're doing that. Not only, not only are you bringing all the bad, all the wrath that Hashem gave them onto yourself, but you're also losing your olam haba. Now, he wouldn't tell them this as uh, yelling at them, hey, you rasha, mirusha. No, he would tell them, listen, this is, this is a reality. A rebuke, a real rebuke, is not a, just yelling at somebody because you like yelling at somebody. A real rebuke is because you love them. A lot of Baalei Tshuva and sometimes Noahides that finally discovered the truth find it very difficult to live among their past. Find it very difficult to live with their parents, with their friends, with their past right next to them. You with me today? You sure? We're on Tuesday. A lot of people have a difficulty. Reason why? They see everybody else sinning. They finally did tshuva. You're disturbing me now. Now you're disturbing me. They see everyone else decide to finally do tshuva. Everyone else, I'm sorry, they finally started doing tshuva. They started keeping Shabbat. They decided to convert. They realized the New Testament is worse than toilet paper used. They realized the truth, and everyone else still lives a lie. So what do they want to do? They're like, ah, it's hard for me to be next to these people. Look, this guy's driving on Shabbat. This guy's still going out with his Goya. This girl is going out with six guys at the same time. This girl doesn't know how to dress. This guy believes in some idol. This guy thinks that Judaism is about clothing. You know, it's, everybody's a fool. And they start yelling, Hey, you Rasha, you Merusha, you are Lavan, you are Esav, you are... What happens? Not only does everybody start hating them, not only do they start hating their own life, but they're also not even doing a mitzvah. They're also not only not doing a mitzvah, they're actually fulfilling a sin. The Torah says, Ocheach tocheach et amitecha velo tisa alavchet. You must rebuke your brother, but don't let it come, bring you to sin. Meaning that even rebuke, which is important, which we've learned countless times about how important it is, has to be done a certain way. You cannot do rebuke. Rule number one, you cannot do rebuke out of anger. You cannot do rebuke out of animosity. If you're angry, stay quiet. Stay quiet. Kamal Masechet Megillah says, if a word is worth one dollar, Silence is worth two. If you're an angry person and you don't know how to control yourself, be quiet. Bring someone who knows how to talk. Why? Because you're not going to lead them to do tshuva this way. You're not going to lead them to go against Hashem. Not because they don't like Hashem, because they don't like you. 
They won't do what you said. Not what Hashem said. They don't know what Hashem said. They're still living in Avodah Zarah. They're still uh, driving on Shabbat. They're still doing whatever they're doing because they don't know. Either they don't know or they don't believe. By you being as angry as you are, you're making them go against Hashem, not because they don't like Hashem, because they don't like you. So you're not doing a mitzvah. Shmuel the Katan, when he saw someone going against Hashem, he would tell him the truth on the spot. He would be as excited as you could possibly be. But the whole statement was out of love. Meaning, you can hear me sometimes raise my voice. You can hear me sometimes say things quietly, change the flux, I fluctuate my voice. I yell, I scream. But at the end of the day, there's not one person on earth that can say, I hate Jews. Or Gentiles. Reason why, you don't do this if you do. You don't do this if you hate people. There's no money. There's no fame. There's no fortune. There's only problems. So, Shmuel Katan says, if you're going to rebuke people and you tell them the truth, you're only doing it because you want Number one, to honor Hashem. And Hashem's name is not is dishonored, you must do something. Number two, you're trying to help them. Not help yourself. What is it like? Someone came to Rav Steinemann, Sheikh Yeh. Baruch Hashem, he's already 105. One of the Gedolei Ado. Religious guy. Comes to him, he says, Kvod Arav. My son went off the derech, and every day I pray for him to die. Because he goes against Hashem. It's a real story. I pray for him to die, because he went off the derech. It's Mechalel Shabbat. I pray for him to die. What do you think, for the Rav? You think it's a, it's a mitzvah, right? So the Rav says to him, Now, in your neighborhood where you live, is your son... The only Mechalel Shabbat that there is is the only one that went off the derech and everyone is tzaddikim, little Rabbi Akivas, or there's a few others. Goes, no, Kvodarab, come on, we live in the world. Of course, there's a lot of other people that don't keep Shabbat. There's a lot of other people that don't keep mitzvot. A lot, the majority don't keep anything. So the Rav says to him, now for them, do you also pray that they also die? Do you pray for them to die too? No. Oh, you only pray for your son to die. Because yes, then you're not doing a mitzvah. You're not doing anything at all that's, a, that's not a sin. Why? Because you're not even praying for something to help your son. You're not even doing anything to praise Hashem. You think that you're praising Hashem. You're praising yourself. If you cared about Hashem, even though you're a fool, and even though what you're doing is a mistake, it is against the Torah, you'd pray for everyone that goes against Hashem to die. You're only praying that your son dies because your foolishness is full of gava. It's full of pride. Your son is embarrassing you. That's why you're praying for him to die. Not because of it. It has nothing to do with Hashem. You were shot. When you're rebuking someone, are you rebuking them because they're embarrassing you? Or because they're embarrassing Hashem? Are you rebuking them because it's not so comfortable for you to introduce your immodest mom to the people that are coming for your house for a shiur because she doesn't know how to dress yet? Or is it because it's against Hashem and you want her to have a lamaba? Why? Why are you doing it? Shmuel Katan is telling was known as someone that rebukes, meaning that it's not so nice to always hear what he has to say. Because sometimes what he has to say has to do with you. Sometimes what he has to say obligates you to change. It's the truth, but it's not always fun to hear. He says, I'm only going to tell it to you because of the honor of Hashem. It has nothing to do with me. I'm a katan. Little. I mean nothing. I'm just a messenger. 
when Rava got sick, when Rava got sick, he would tell his students to go publicize that he's sick. Go publicize that I'm sick. So they asked him, Kodarav, Lamdeni, teach us. Why? Why do you want to? I mean, usually someone's sick. You don't want to publicize it to the world. You don't want to put it on the news. Hey, by the way, I'm sick. I'm dying. It's not exactly an uh, honor. So Rabbi says, no. It's good for you to publicize that I'm sick because then my enemies will celebrate. And this pasuk from Proverbs will come true that it will displease Hashem and Hashem can take the wrath from me and put it on them. So he publicizes him being sick. Abaye, his chavuta, used to say, why, why is it that Rava was hated? Why does he have enemies? Because he used to rebuke. He used to tell people the truth. He used to stand for God. This is what it says. It doesn't matter what you like. It doesn't matter what your, what your bank account looks like. It means nothing. This is the truth. That's what it says. Beginning, middle, end. You don't want to donate? Don't donate. Who wants your donation anyway? You rasha. Who wants your donation? Do you know that many of the big tzaddikim don't take donations from Rishayim? Unfortunately today, there's not many tzaddikim left. But I know that every time someone gives me money to go to give to Rabbi Ephraim, I have to make sure that this person is a Shomer Shabbat. Why? Because before, before I give him the money, I have to tell Rabbi Ephraim, like, oh yeah, so-and-so gave $500. Who is this so-and-so? Why are they giving? They keep Shabbat? If the answer is no, return the money. We don't take money from Mechal Shabbat. Why? Chaz V'Shalom, they're going to be a Chilul Shabbat for me. Chaz V'Shalom, they're going to have to work an extra day on Shabbat for me to give me the $500. We don't need that money. Hashem will send another way. So if you don't want to donate, don't donate. Who needs your donation? We're standing up for God. It's not a, it's not a popularity contest. We're not looking for fans. You want to look for fans? You want fans? You, each one of you want to become G'dola Do by next week? You can become G'dola Do in one week. Write a Psaq al that wigs are allowed. Write a Psaq al that wigs are allowed. Write a Psaq al that in today's age you're allowed to drive on Shabbat to the Beit Knesset. Write a Psaq al that uh, modesty is only theoretical. It's not relevant to our generation. And write under your name, Orthodox. Because if you say it's Reform and Conservative, that's the same thing they've been saying already for a long time, along with the fact that homosexuality and, you know, bestiality and all this other garbage is allowed also. But if you say it's an Orthodox Rabbi, ask do do. Let me donate. Wait, wait, who do I make the check payable to? Actually, no, I think I need to get a bigger check because not enough space in this check to write the number. Do you accept large sums like this? Is there room in your bank account? You have an opportunity to sell your soul to the devil every day. Every day. Every single day. Rava stood up for the truth so he had enemies. All the prophets that ever lived, their job was to stand up for the truth. So they had enemies. Sometimes their own people were the worst enemies. Zechariah was cut up into pieces. Isaiah cut up into pieces. Isaiah was cut up into pieces by his own grandson. When Nebuchadnezzar, the general for Nebuchadnezzar, came to Yerushalayim, he saw that there was walking around, and he sees that there's blood boiling. It's 
blood boiling over there some what is this blood boy ask the Jews ask the rabbis what's this blood boiling now the blood boiling was the blood of, of, of Zachariah of Zachariah it was his blood for years it was boiling for years the ground wouldn't swallow his blood years now, it's not every day you see boiling blood so Nebuzal Dan was a smart man he said, what is this? He said, oh no, it's nothing, it's nothing. It was not nothing. Boiling blood? It's not nothing. What is it? Tell me or I'm going to kill you. What is it? No, no, it's from Kobanot. Kobanot. We do Kobanot. We do sacrifices for Hashem, for our God. We do sacrifices with the sheep. And the blood is there. And this one just happens to be boiling. So, okay, do one. Do another one. I want to see. Do one. No. They take sheep. Blood comes out. No boiling. Oh, no, no, maybe this one didn't work. We'll try another one. Nothing. Because if you don't tell me the truth of what this blood is, I'm going to kill all of you. He said, listen, what should we say? Chatanu avinu pashanu. It's our prophet's blood. We killed him. Why? He told us the truth. We didn't want to hear it. He told us we have to keep Shabbat. We want to keep driving. He told us we were not allowed to have Thanksgiving dinners with our uh, going, uh, going friends. We didn't want to hear it. He told us we have to be modest all the time, inside the house and outside the house. We didn't want to hear it. He told us that wigs are not allowed. We didn't want to hear it. He told us we have to be kosher people. We didn't want to hear it, so we killed him. Nebu Zardan said, okay, I will avenge his blood. He started killing everyone. Started killing the rabbis, started killing the kids, started killing everyone, started killing, killing, killing. But he kept going back to the same spot, and the blood is still boiling. And he screams out to heaven and he says, Zechariah, Zechariah, I have killed the best of them, but your blood is still boiling. Do you want me to kill the rest of them? And the blood comes. Zechariah did a kalva chomer. He did a needless to say. He did an argument in his head. He said, if this is the punishment, I ended up being the hand that gave the punishment for all of these people that killed one prophet, one prophet, one tzaddik, one rebuker, all of them, millions of people got punished for going against the Torah. What will I get if I don't do tshuva? At that very moment, rega shel emet, a moment of truth, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, which was pretty much second in command after the king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, took off his uniform, joined Am Yisrael, converted, sent a suicide note, back to the kingdom so they don't go look for him, join Ami said becoming part of the slaves and converted to Judaism. And his descendants ended up becoming Tamidei Chachamim with Ruach HaKodesh. Rega Shelemet, a moment of truth. People didn't like to hear the truth, ever. You hear in Tefillah every day, in Shachrit, one of the paragraphs you'll see tomorrow, Abaye says, Anshe Muna Avadu. Men of truth are gone. It's referring to the time of the Bet Mikdash, where Hashem decided there's no more people that are going to rebuke Am Israel. There's no more Anshe Muna. There's no more people that can actually stand up for the Emet, for the truth. I have to destroy the Bet Mikdash. No one's going to do Chuba without the Emet. Abaye says in Masech Ketubot, page 105b, if you see a Talmit Chacham, then everyone likes him. Don't be misled. They only like him because he doesn't rebuke them. You see a rabbi, everyone likes him. Everyone likes him. They donate. They compliment. There's nothing ever wrong with him. No one ever goes against him. 
Just know for sure. There's no other reason. There's one reason why they all like him. Why? He never tells them anything that's wrong with them. He tells them they're allowed to celebrate Xmas. They're allowed to eat turkeys with the goyim. They're allowed to wear wigs. They're allowed to wear nothing. They're allowed to go to the beach on Shabbat. Whatever you want. Orthodox, not orthodox. My docs, your docs. Whatever you want. Rabbi Noach. Rabbi convenient. Noach also means convenient. Whatever is comfortable, whatever is convenient for you. So, the issues we have today are not so different than the ones we've had in the past. En chadash tachat Hashemish. There's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Now, Rav Baruch Epstein gave an extraordinary chidush about this particular issue. It says, how could it be that Hashem turns His wrath? Because according to Rashi, anyone, obviously, all, all the Torah, Gemara, all the different places, says there's no such thing as suffering without sin. Meaning, anyone that suffers, anyone that Hashem is giving Him suffering, unless it's suffer, uh, love punishment, the reality is it's for some type of sin that He made. So, when a person gets, loses money, health, whatever, whatever problem, disaster he has in his life, this in essence is a punishment slash wake-up call slash chesed from Hashem. There's a lot of different parts to every single punishment that we have. Now, if we wish that person, we're happy that that person is suffering, Shlomo Melech is telling us, we could easily turn this thing around and bring it on ourselves. In the non-Jewish world, they call this karma. They think that it's, a, it's, a, it's an invention by the gleam. Karma is not an invention by the gleam. Karma is just another word to describe this verse. So what goes around comes around. But if you wish somebody else bad, or you're celebrating that they have bad, Hashem says, okay, let's bring it to you. Why? Because obviously, you think you're better. You think you, they deserve it, but you don't. So let's check you. Let's check if you really don't. Because what you're missing here is that when, I, when Hashem punishes someone, He doesn't get any joy out of it. He's not happy that He's punishing someone. To such an extent that he's not even happy to punish the Rishayim. Even if the Rishayim are non-Jews. Where do we learn this from? We learn this from when Hashem Yidbarach destroyed all of the Egyptians. When he destroyed all of the Egyptians, Am Yitzhak started singing. Because Am Yitzhak was slaves. They were in Egypt for 210 years. But they were slaves for 86 years. For 86 years, they, the Egyptians, the Shimam, Killed Jews in different forms, killed the babies, killed the adults, killed this, killed that. So Am Yisrael is not a slave anymore. So they were celebrating. They have, you know, this, it's a very normal thing to do. Now the angels also wanted to celebrate. Angels wanted to celebrate also. Hashem says, no, you, they celebrate. It's normal for them to celebrate. Look what happened to them for the next 86 years. You don't celebrate. Why? Why are you happy that I'm destroying my own creation? Even though they're Rishayim, even though they went and they killed and they did, they're still my creation. What is this like? It's like sometimes you get into a fight with your brother or your sister or someone that you're close to, and you yell at them, you call them a bad name, but five minutes later you make up. Ten minutes later you make up, even if there was hitting and yelling and this, especially when they're little kids. Little kids always fight and hit and this, and they hate each other, and I hate them, and I hate them, and I hate them. Five minutes later, they're best friends again. Now, if somebody else does that, say, hey, yeah, your brother, what a... Da, 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 immediately, they're now your enemy. Even though you just said the same thing about your brother. They're saying the same thing you said. Like you're saying, oh, yeah, my brother's... A, da, 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 da. Say, yeah, you're right. What do you mean I'm right? I can say it, but you can't. I, it's my brother. I can say it, but you can't. 
I can say it. You can't. Why? It's my brother. So, Rav Baruch Epstein says in Parashat Bechukotai, chapter 26, verse 17, says different levels of punishment, Hashem Erechem, that Hashem tells us if we don't listen to Him, what we get. And one of the punishments, unfortunately, is probably something we've all dealt with or are still dealing with. Stress. But not normal stress. Stress where we feel like we're like under attack. He says, and I will turn my attention against you. You will be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you will subjugate to you. You will flee with no one pursuing you. Did you ever meet these people? Or were one of these people? We felt like everyone's against you. You're in an office and everyone hates you. No one actually told you they hate you, but you feel like they hate you. Or you're in a neighborhood. No one ever said anything to you, but you feel like you're not welcome. And not only you're not welcome, but everyone wants you to fail. Everyone's rooting against you. Maybe there's a conspiracy after you. I remember when I was on Wall Street through the last years that I was on there, I was convinced, I'm telling you from my own experience, I was convinced there was some type of behind-the-scenes black ball against me. How could it be that everything that I was doing was going wrong all of a sudden? For years it went right. How all of a sudden it's going wrong? For years, everything's right. All of a sudden, everything's wrong. Every, all of a sudden, everyone's disappearing. All the contacts, all the, like, just craziness. I was convinced. Only thing is, I was right. It just wasn't coming from Wall Street. So Hashem Barach says, you will flee, but no one is pursuing you. Meaning, you're running away. And usually, if you run away, it's because somebody's chasing you. He says, no, but no one's actually chasing you. You're running away from nothing. You're running away from your own mind. You think that someone's chasing you. No one's chasing you. What's causing this, what's causing this feeling? All the sins you made. All the demons you created. All the problems you created for yourself, that's what's chasing you. Now, in Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, it says, Ve'elokim yevakesh et anirdaf. Hashem helps the person that's chased. If someone is chased, if someone is the victim, Hashem helps them. Hashem helps the underdog. Someone is chased by people, Hashem helps them. So Bor Epstein says, what's the chidush? In Parashat Bechukotai, it says the opposite of what Ecclesiastes say. Ecclesiastes says, if you're being chased, Hashem will help you. Parashat Bechukotai says, no one's chasing you, but you're running away. So why isn't Hashem helping you? So Baruch Epstein says, the real punishment is that Hashem makes you feel alone. The real punishment is that, yes, no one is chasing you, but you feel like you're the victim. You feel like something is wrong because your neshama realizes that Hashem is hiding from you. Hashem makes you feel alone. Hashem makes you feel like there's nothing to live for. There's nothing to do. Why? Your fault. You made some sins. So now a lot of these people that we're upset about, that are Michalel Shabbat, that are still Christian, that are doing all these different things, and we want to rebuke them, you have to understand that they have this feeling. They have this feeling of emptiness. They have this feeling of being a victim. They have this feeling that everyone's against them. Many times. Because Hashem is not with them. Many times. So if you go at them and attack them and call them reshaim 
and rebuke them out of anger instead of out of love, all you're doing is confirming their, exist, their, their, their belief. If you're going at them and yelling at them and screaming at them out of anger, not because you love them, not you're passionate and you love them and I love you and I really want you the best for you and listen, I know I'm passionate, I know my voice is loud a little time, but I love you. But listen, you should keep Shabbat. But listen, you should put clothes on. Hey, I bought you an outfit. Like, something. Like, you're doing it out, you're showing them your love, not just words and not, you're showing them your love and your passion, that's fine. But if you're just full of hate, animosity, and you just think that they should die because they're going against the Shem, it's not because of the Shem, it's because of you, it's because of your pride. And all you're doing is you're confirming, you're confirming their fears, you're confirming their stresses. They are scared to death because they feel like God left. They're not going to tell you that. They're going to tell you J.C. Penney's here. They're going to tell you they're uh, whatever. All this nonsense is, it's nonsense. They're all empty. They're empty. They pretend to be happy, but they commit suicide a week later. Sometimes they're religious Jews. Sometimes they're religious Christians. Sometimes they're Noahides. Sometimes they're secular people. Sometimes they're your friends, sometimes they're your family, sometimes they're your spouse. They're all walks of life. Shmuel the Katan says, you have to stand for the truth, but there's a way to do it. Yeah, there's a way to do it. If you're going to be one of these horrendous people that's very easy to hate because you're always the person that says, oh, I told you so, you're not only not doing a mitzvah, you're making a sin. You're distancing them away from Hashem. You know those people always say, oh yeah, I told you so. What do you mean you told me so? Yeah, I told you you shouldn't buy from this guy. You shouldn't say, I told you, I told you. I... Even if you told him, why are you telling him now? How is it going to help him? Telling somebody I told you so is the most annoying thing you can possibly do. It's full of animosity. It's full of pride and arrogance. And it's only helpful for your arrogance. It's only helpful for your pride. It does not, not only it doesn't help the person, not only it doesn't help the person, it actually makes them feel like nothing. You are telling them something, like I told you so. It doesn't matter what it was. It doesn't matter whether I told you so, don't buy this car. I told you so, don't marry this girl. I told you so, don't. It doesn't make a difference. Saying I told you so to anyone for any reason, even if you did. I'm not saying if you didn't, you're just making it up, you're just a psychopath. So wait, you did, you told them so, and they went against you, and you're right, and you're reminding them that you're right. You are Rasha, not them. Why? You're making them feel like this. You're making them feel like nothing. Trust me, they know you told them. You don't need to remind them. The only reason you're saying I told you so is because you want everyone to know. I know. I know. You don't care that they're suffering. You don't care about what you actually even told them. You care about winning. You care about you know. You're better. You're great. Problem is, this is also a small form of mitkabed bikum chadero. This, this I told you so is also a form of getting honor as a result of your friend's failure. And you could easily lose your olam haba for it. Do you know how many people get joy out of telling the whole world, I told you so, every day, every moment, right now as we speak? There's probably someone that was watching the lecture, just stop mid-sentence, telling somebody, I told you, ah, nothing, I didn't say nothing, I didn't say nothing, I never even spoke, I'm mute, I don't know how to speak, I don't know how to speak. I told you so, it's like one of the pleasures of life. Well, I'm telling you, if I told you so, you could lose a lot of don't be a hero. Don't I told you so nothing. You want to help somebody do tshuva? You want to really help somebody do tshuva? You want to really help somebody change their life? Give them the feeling that it's their idea. Not yours. You have nothing to do with it. It's their idea. That's why I always tell people to give CDs. Why? Because all you're doing is giving the guy a CD. Sometimes in their hand, sometimes in their mailbox, sometimes you leave it on a desk, 
It doesn't make a difference. You gave the CD that has the answers. You gave him a CD that has 30, 40, 50 hours worth of Torah on there. Now, at first, they're thinking, yeah, you know, but Salah gave me the CD. Simcha gave me the CD. Amos gave me the CD. They're thinking the first five seconds, like, ah, yeah, yeah, they, they're pride. They have to fight their pride. But if they have a merit in Shemaim and Hashem wants their tshuva, they're actually going to put the CD in one day. Five minutes into listening to the CD, they forgot about you. Five minutes into the CD, they're thinking, I can't believe I found this guy. I found this guy. I can't believe I, f- I, can't believe I found this. I have to tell Betzalel about it. They forgot you gave me the CD. I have to tell almost about it. This guy is great. Wow, I have to do tshuva. I have to- what? It's their idea now. Now you have a chance. Now you have a chance to save this person. Why? It's their idea. But as long as you keep telling them, I told you so, and I told you so, and I told you so, I'm telling you so. They're not going to do tshuva. Not because of the Torah, because of you. Because they don't want to hear I told you so. Raise your hand if you like to be heard, uh, told I told you so. No one. No one wants to be told I told you so. Why? It's the worst feeling in the world. It's the worst feeling. Why? You're telling the person you're an idiot and everyone else knew it. So, it's a very dangerous thing to tell people I told you so. Very dangerous. Baruch Epstein says, this I told you so. It's not really I told you so. It's not really I told you so. You didn't tell him anything really. The sad reality is that both of you didn't realize what the problem was. You told them to go leave this idol leave this religion, leave this kfirah against Hashem. You thought that's the problem. They didn't want to hear it because they didn't want to hear it from you. They thought they were on the right track. But Baruch Epstein says, the real problem, the real problem, the real problem is that God wasn't with them. He's there. Always. But he gave them the feeling that they're empty, that there's nothing, that there's no point to life. And that's already enough of I told you so. That's worse than any I told you so that you can ever give someone. So that extra I told you so you're doing, that extra pride that you're doing, they're already suffering as it is. The guy already feels like God left him. The guy already doesn't know what to believe in. He doesn't know what is the difference between him and the monk. You're telling him I told you so. The guy already lost an arm, lost a leg, lost a head, lost a everything. You tell him I told you so. Why? What do you get out of it? Go stroke your own ego somewhere else. Do something else. But that's the reason why they had Shmuel Katan be the one that does this specific thing of telling everyone. If you do, I told you so. You have no Lamaba. Why? Because he's not telling you, I told you so. He's telling you, I'm telling you now. If you say, I told you so, you have no Lamaba. And I'm not telling you because I'm smarter than you. I'm not telling you because I have the right to have prophecy. I'm not telling you because of any other reason other than I love you. I'm a, that's it. I'm a Katan. I'm little. I'm nothing. But I'm telling you because I love you. I'm rebuking you because I love you. Not because of any other reason. It doesn't give me any kavod. It doesn't do anything good for me. I don't want your money anyway. Hashem will provide. There's no other benefit. Whether you listen to me or not, it's purely your benefit. And that's the one thing that gets people off guard. When you actually come to someone and you tell them the truth, not for any other benefit, but purely for them. 
purely for the sake of Hashem. That's it. Then it's obvious. Then it's obvious that it's the truth. You don't have to debate. There's no more debate. If you noticed any of the lectures that I've done where there was debates with people, at some point, the debate stopped. Why? Because everything that they thought I'm doing it for, they realize I'm not. I tell them in the middle of the lecture, I don't want your money anyway. It's not that we don't need it. We, the, the organization costs a ton of money. How are we paying for it? Only God knows. It's a miracle every week. Forget every month. It used to be every month. Now it's every week. It's a miracle. People want everything for free. I mentioned on the lectures, listen, you know, we're giving to the Balabite a Kiruv package. I get 25 people. I want one, two, I want one, two. Okay, buy one. It's $95. Oh, no, I don't have any money. You don't have $95? Where do you live? In Bangladesh? Where do you live? You live in Afghanistan next to Osama's body? You don't have $95? That's like, that's it? No one has any money? Bezat Hashem Incorporated is the only one that has money left? Everyone else is broke? No one has any money? Oh, can you send me some CDs? Yeah, can, can you pay for any of them? Can you sponsor? I mean, it costs money. It's not free. God didn't send it at Mount Sinai with the other stuff. We actually have to pay for it. Can you give? Can you do something? Oh, I don't have any money. Where do you live? Or I live in Jersey in a $3 million house. Like, no one has any money. Come on. Come on. People have to start waking up and start, like, realizing. You have to start looking at the world around you. Enough. No problem giving stuff out for free. I have no problem helping anyone that's in need. In reality, it's all God's money anyway. We have to ask ourselves, are we being honest? Are we being honest? One of the main things we learn in this parasha is something that Yaakov Avinu stood for. And one of the reasons why he got the blessing that he did is after all the cheating and the lying that Lavan did to him. He finally goes to his wives, the daughters of Lavan, and he says to them, Listen, I, you know I've been honest with your father, and he's cheated me a hundred times. He cheated me a hundred times, he cheated me about the wife, cheated me about this, cheated me, cheated me, cheated me, cheated me. Cheated me. So he said, okay, no problem, let's leave. Lavan chases them, catches them. He says, Lavan, I worked for you. I was with you for 20 years. When I was with you, none of the cattle had any miscarriages. Anyone that had any cattle that had a problem, any deformity, any injury, I took it as a loss, a personal loss for myself. I was honest with you. You were succeeded with me. And, da, 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 da. and long story short, I was honest. And even, even now that I'm rebuking you, even now that I'm rebuking you, I'm not doing it because I hate you. Despite that you cheated me a hundred times. Despite that you stole from me. Despite that you're a liar and a cheat and a thief and everything else that's bad in this world. I'm doing because I love you. I'm doing because you're one of Hashem's creation. As strange as that sounds, you're one of Hashem's creations. And I was honest with you because of that. So the question is, are we honest? Or do we have blood on our hands? Are we stealing from our bosses? Are we stealing from organizations? Are we stealing from our wives? Are we stealing from our husbands? Are we stealing from our kids? And most importantly, are we stealing from God? Now, at the very least, at the very least, we should work on one thing tonight. Don't steal anyone's eternity. Sages say that if we looked at everyone, there's one particular sin that's virtually impossible to escape. And that's stealing. People steal without even knowing they're stealing. They steal time from their bosses. 
They steal money from governments. They steal money from parents, children, organizations, and so on. People steal. Many times because they don't consider the world around them as anything. They think they are, they are themselves the center of the world. Many times because they don't, just simply don't care. They're selfish. Now to fix the sin of stealing is very, very difficult and practically impossible without Yirat Shemaim. And the only way to get Yirat Shemaim is by learning Musar every single day. That is what we're trying to do with all of these shiurim. Now the form of stealing that we're talking about today is not money. We're talking about money. The form of stealing I'm talking about today is stealing the olam ba of another person. And the punishment for it is losing our own olam ba. The reason why what Shmuel HaKatan wrote was already written in the Torah by Shlomo Melech was written in the Shulchan Aruch as an Alakha. Was written in two of the books of the Rambam as Alakha. Is in the Gemara in a couple of different places. Is because the risk is everything. Everything's on the line. You can keep Shabbat, you can marry the tzaddikah, you can marry a tzaddik, you, everything is good. You do this, everything, everything goes to nothing. You can lose everything in a second. And without knowing this, and actually putting this into, like putting the disc into your head, and pressing play permanently, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat to never ever say I told you so, you're at risk for losing everything, like that. Now, of course, you could do tshuva. Everything is subject to tshuva. But do tshuva. Chatanu, avinu, pashanu. Hashem, I'm sorry. I said I told you so 50 million times in my life. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I'm not, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to say I told you so ever again. You didn't punish them for me. You punished them for whatever reason you punished them for. It's your world. I'm just living in it. They didn't fail because of me. They didn't get sick because of me. They didn't lose because of me. Nothing happened because of me. I'm me and then them. It's your world, Hashem. You don't work for me. Stop pretending God works for you. And these imbeciles that tell the world, no, God works for you and He does for you and He does for you. Stop listening to them. They're just tainting your head. with Tum'ah. The reality of it is, Everything is on a line on something very simple. And why is it so simple? Is because it's natural for us. It's natural for us to say, I told you so. Because it's natural for us to want to be right. It's natural for us to remind people we're right. It's natural for us for us to want to be arrogant. To be arrogant. It's a natural thing. Because the Yetzirah is our very nature. Hashem Baruch says it himself. Naturally, they're Raim. Naturally, they're, they're evil. Naturally, just, it's just the Yetzirah. Unless you work on this Yetzirah and you defeat him and you kill him and you do whatever you can to almost destroy him every day, every night, every afternoon, unless you work on it, you've already lost. Chazal specifically say, a person that wants, Allah Maba, a person that wants to do the will of Hashem, has to understand that the Yetzirah, the Satan, the Malach HaMavit, it's all the same thing, is like someone standing over you with an axe, ready to chop your head off. So the students ask the sage, what if you don't feel that? What if you don't feel like he's standing over you? He says, that's because you already chopped your head. You have to feel stress and pressure, not because of money, not because of who's the smartest in class and who has the nicest car and who's right and who's wrong. No. The only stress you should have is am I fulfilling Hashem's will? And every Jew is obligated to say, when will my deeds be like the deeds of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. 
as great as their deeds are, and we're going to go over some Chidushim Be'ezot Hashem tomorrow night in Miami of the Parasha and a few other things, of course, of some of the deeds, some of the extraordinary deeds that the sages did. Things that are beyond what we think is human nature. And every single one of us has to really, really say to themselves, instead of I told you so to everyone, every single person has to say, when will my deeds be like Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov? Meaning, when will I be like Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov? As great as they were, we're supposed to emulate them. Are we there yet?